In 1838, Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs issued Missouri Executive Order 44, which said, quote, The Mormons must be treated as enemies and exterminated or driven from the state if necessary for the public peace. Six years later, a mob in Illinois murdered Mormon prophet Joseph Smith. The Mormons were left a leaderless, despised community scattered in settlements across the Midwest. Now, they could easily have ended up as a footnote in 19th century religious history alongside countless other short-lived sects that tried to set their hand at living their understanding of Christianity before being ground down by the homogenizing force of American expansion. Instead, now, in 2010, there are well over 14 million Mormons worldwide, and those numbers include captains of industry and political leaders, cultural influencers, one of whom gained 48% of the popular vote in the 2012 presidential election. How did this amazing transformation happen? How did the Mormons go from a highly stigmatized sect on the American periphery to one of the most all-American of religious traditions? Well, they did it first by fleeing to the West to escape the persecution and assimilationist demands of the American state. And then, when that state finally caught up with them, by doing their best to perfect what America was trying to do, to the self-conscious creation of a religious, cultural, and political entity that could assimilate America's market forces on their own terms. So after Joseph Smith was killed, the Mormons were thrown into, obviously, uh, a shocked and horrified sense of confusion. Well, how would they go on? Uh, who, in fact, was in charge? Was this going to be a hereditary monarchy? Uh, uh, would the blood of, of uh, the prophet have to course in the veins of anyone who would claim leadership? Would people just go their separate ways? Would they assume that this was a sign that the church was wrong? Was this proof that the prophecy had failed? Was this a sign from God to find another uh, brand of Christianity? Before things could get out of hand, though, one man, Brigham Young, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, which was sort of the executive council of Mormonism at that time, seized the moment. Uh, Brigham Young was an uh, uh, early convert to Mormonism, and like Joseph Smith, was uh, a religious seeker from the burned-over district of upstate New York. And from his position within, within the quorum, he, he affirmed the th authority of the quorum and was able to gain enough supporters in, uh, amongst the influential members of the church to assert a new course of action. The Mormons would get the fuck out of Dodge. The Mormons would no longer have to deal with neighbors uh, on their periphery in American states and territories uh, just begging for a chance to fucking kill them. Instead, they would head west to the Salt Lake Valley, which at that time was the northernmost point of the uh, Republic of Mexico. The Mormon uh, solution to uh, captivity in Egypt would be a flight as the Hebrews had had uh, into the wilderness. Brigham Young said at the time, quote, I am he who led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and my arm is stretched out to save my people Israel. The Mormons would save themselves, would uh, prevent their souls from being uh, pulled back into the matrix of antebellum American uh, market culture, which was in the process of tearing everybody from the land and all other verities and throwing them into a new, uh, a new modern world. And instead of allowing that to happen to them, the Mormons would find land where they could set their own country, essentially, to create a sovereignty where the prophet's words would serve as the basis for this civilization. Where instead of just going where the money is, uh, as uh, people in America were doing, they would work together to create Zion on Earth. And they self-consciously uh, modeled themselves on bi the biblical uh, Hebrews uh, and, uh, whether consciously or on, sought to become 
the Jews of the American continent. Uh, this is around the time that Brigham Young starts referring to non-Mormons as Gentiles in a self-conscious mimicry of the relationship between uh, biblical Jews and, and non-believers. So, over 3,000 families comprising over 16,000 people who lived in the Mormon settlements in Missouri and Illinois and Ohio started selling all their property in order to buy supply, the supplies necessary to make a long westward journey. And the first wagon trains left Nauvoo, Illinois, on February 4th, 1846. And this trek west becomes a, the, a fundamental uh, element of Mormon self-mythology, uh, of, of their, their foundation myth. The, the creation of the Camp of Zion, uh, the the trek to the winter quarters in Nebraska, and the final settling uh, on the banks of the Salt Lake, of the Great Salt Lake, and this is this is in miniature the uh, story of the American westward expansion. Of course, because it's the Mormons, it's happening earlier than it was for most Americans, who once again were following the money. You'd had by this point very little westward expansion. Uh, of the of into America's territories at this time, uh, most Americans were still slugging it out in the uh, in the lands w east of the Mississippi. Here you see the Mormons leave uh, setting out two years before or three years before the first large scale westward internal migration occurs to California with the gold rush. Once again, following the money, uh, the Mormons believed that they were following God. And so they carried out their own Oregon Trail uh, before that became a defining American experience. But by the time the Mormons, having fa faced numerous travails on the way, finally got to Salt Lake Valley, uh, it had been ceded to the United States as part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, ending the Mexican-American War. So that means that the states that they had tried to fled were waiting for them, basically. Uh, and Young made accommodations with the federal authorities because the federal authorities at this point had a vested interest in seeing people fill these newly acquired areas. And so there was uh, some subsidy to, uh, from the U.S. to the Mormon mission. But, of course, it was accepted reluctantly. There was a lot of friction. Uh, and But in 1850, the uh, Utah was turned into a U.S. territory as part of the, as part of the Compromise of 1850. And Brigham Young was appointed the territorial governor. So Young sets about trying to establish a Zion in uh, Zion in the, in the in the Salt Flats, and he sends missionaries uh, across the country and to Europe, where they'd had success recruiting, uh, making a call to a gathering at Zion. Uh, the idea that all Mormons everywhere should make their way to Utah, so that they could build a country. Uh, in the wilderness. Of course, there are plenty of natives there who the Mormons make uh, half-hearted attempts to convert. And remember, according to Mormon doctrine, the Native Americans were Lamanites, who uh, were the descendants of those who had uh, fought, who had fought amongst each other in the uh, narrative of the Book of Mormon. And it was Mormon policy to try to bring them back to righteousness. But Obviously, they were doing that while taking land, so it made things sort of awkward, and their attempts never really made to much. But they did have a free freedom to w live their own way that they had never been able to really achieve in the United uh, when they'd been in the United States, in Ohio and Illinois and and in Missouri, and where they had clashed against existing American structures of power. Uh, here they were able to build them from scratch. They laid out Salt Lake City in a perfectly rationalized grid pattern around a central temple mound. They sent settlers out to uh, to claim land across the West. Uh, they've settled most of the major uh, towns and cities of Utah, but they also settled cities as far away as Las Vegas, Nevada, and San Bernardino, California. And they even applied uh, planning to uh, the settling layout. 
uh, Welsh immigrants who came to uh, Salt Lake were sent to the southwest corner, which had uh, iron ore deposits, in which they were hoping to mine. Uh, Southern American converts came and were sent to the southeast of the state to grow cotton. That part of Utah is still to this name, to this day, called Dixie. The Mormons pooled money to create a perpetual emigration fund to pay for people to be able to come to Utah and build a country. Uh, the, so the later, because people kept coming, the, the wagon trains kept coming, but the second and third wave of Mormon immigrants to Utah were generally the poorest uh, European migrants, people who from England, say, uh, who had come to the United States with not much and were only able to access a small amount of a subsidy. Uh, and they were told to not bother with expensive oxen when they were buying supplies, but to buy hand carts and walk the whole way, dragging the carts, which thousands of them amazingly did. And that the hand cart is to this day a a powerful symbol of uh, of Mormon uh, resiliency and and commitment that people literally drag their possessions behind them like draw, draft animals in order to build Zion in Utah. And this was a real project. Young and the Mormon leadership had a vision of a cooperative system of economy to reflect the uh, religious solidarity of the Mormons. They did not have to live as strangers the way that pe the Gentiles did, the way those who had fallen away from the word of God had to. They were all in the a brotherhood and sisterhood of believers, which means that they did not need the market. And so there was a concerted effort early on uh, in the first couple of uh, decades, especially, of uh, the Mormon settlement of Utah, where there was the church attempted to create uh, organs of cooperative economy, uh, collectively owned manufactories, land, uh, an attempt to suppress exchange, to suppress the creation of the market. Uh, at one point, Utah. Uh, at one point, Brigham Young said, "I would rather see every building and fence laid in ashes than to see a trader come in here with his goods." And to that end, they built, uh, they made an attempt to create a collective autarkic government. They didn't want to have to import anything. They didn't have to want to rely on having to export anything. They tried to create a fully self-sufficient internal economy uh, based around collective ownership. Uh, there was an attempt to enforce uh, what was known in the early days uh, of the settlements in Missouri and Illinois as consecration, where people who joined the church would give over all of their, well, their property to the church and collectively own it with other members of the church. It was never, it, they were never able to enforce it and most members never, uh, si never accepted it, but it was an option that was uh, socially emphasized. But most families were always more willing to just pay the 10% tithe to the church that, that they were also, uh, that was also an option available to them. So that made it difficult. But that didn't stop them from trying. Uh, in a small town, in one of the small settlements called Brigham City, they formed something called the Brigham City Cooperative Association, in which citizens would buy shares in order to collectively own things like uh, the general store, uh, all the livestock, uh, textile manufacturing, a dairy, schools. They had a thing called the, um, the Tramp Department that was to employ beggars. A number of other towns founded uh, local cooperative organizations called United Orders that tried to assert collective ownership and to set wages and to distribute food and shelter as equitably as possible. There was even one town, Orderville, that, basic, that completely abolished private property and had a barracks communism where people lived in dorms and ate in cafeterias. And these organs attempted to resist the mercantile trade that was taking root in the cities because remember they can't really keep out non-mormons so non-mormons are moving into utah as well and are starting to trade and that trade is lucrative uh and 
these attempts to create a cooperative economic order are always in competition with this growing mercantile uh, network. And they'll struggle with that until the 1870s when, after the uh, Transcontinental Railroad comes in, the capitalism fully takes over and there's no way to compete with it. And what happens to the to Mormon cooperative living is the same thing that happened to all of uh, 19th century's many attempts at planned communities and utopian projects, your Owenites, your, your new harmonies. They eventually were unable to compete with capitalism because there could be no long-term coexistence between capitalism and cooperative forms of economy uh, unless you have like a serious state power behind it. Uh, and in here, in an internal situation where you have a national market being established at this moment, no internal resistance is going to be, on even a medium time frame, viable. And so, uh, by the 1870s, this strain of, uh, of utopian economics uh, in the Mormon settlements is eventually uh, replaced by the market. Now... Of course, at the same time, Brigham Young is endorsing slavery uh, and uh, promulgating a decree. Once again, Mormon prophets, especially at the top of the uh, pyramid, have the ability to claim prophetic powers that allow them to make ex cathedra proclamations that then have the force of doctrine, uh, which is one way that, which is one of number of uh, places where. Mormonism uh, is similar to the Catholic Church, uh, which makes sense because the Mormonism really is an attempt to fuse the social structures of Catholicism with the dy dynamism of Protestantism, uh, and it's the abs it's the destruction of one or the other that leads uh, Catholics in the cities to stagnate, but at the same time dooms Protestants to a alienating headlong rush away from one another into a brutal competi com competition that destroys all Christian brotherhood. But anyway, this is to say that Brigham Young said, hey, uh, by the way, I know there was some ambiguity early on. We had some uh, black guys and gals running around some of our camps saying that they had been, pro they'd been touched by prophecy as well. Uh, and yes, some of them might have been endorsed by Joseph Smith, but guess what? Uh, there is no, there no bishophood can be bestowed on a black person. Sorry, which is, in its own way, part of the Western process of establishing whites only uh, social relationships. Uh, you see it in all the Western states, uh, certainly in the Pacific Northwest and, and in Utah as well. And this is just uh, a religiously inflected part of that general trend to preserve. Uh, the Western frontier from the, more than anything, the competition of slave labor. So in these early days, while Young and his cadre are trying to impose this new religious orthodoxy and uh, social relationship onto their people and, and struggle against the elements and, and scrape together the money to ma maintain viability, they're also having to do this as U.S. territories, which is an awkward tension, which is an awkward situation because they're trying to build a social structure outside of the American market with a theocratic social structure uh, and a collectivist economic order with, by the way, polygamy and a interpretations of the gospel radically alienating to every mainstream Protestant in the country. Uh, in the early in in this antebellum era, uh, West, Eastern reformers uh, had three great social horrors. The, the The northern bourgeois were terrified of three things: the slave power, the Antichrist in Rome and his army of brainwashed papists, and Mormonism, which felt like sort of an Americanized Catholicism and was rendered even more alienating by the presence of polygamy. Here were people who were not taking orders from their own hearts, but people who were 
obeying a religious hierarchy, just like all of those slum bound Irishmen list cocking their heads to hear the Muzine call from St. Peter's. So there's a, uh, there is a revulsion to Mormonism. There's an attempt by the federal government to, to impose more federal authority on Utah, which leads to conflict between the church hierarchy and, for example, uh, territorial judges who are appointed and sent in by the government. Uh, and out of this, there is a decision by the Buchanan administration coming in just as the sectional crisis is reaching its boiling point and wanting more than anything to make people forget about it and change the subject, decided that he was going to take Mormonism, this thing which was repulsive to all good Americans, north or south of the Mason-Dixon, and rent, make it the, the monster that needed to be slain. Uh, that's one conservative attempt to, mis to redirect anti-slavery politics. Because remember I said there's three things that the northern voter, broadly defined, uh, was horrified by. Well, the slave power could not be confronted by conservatives of both the Democratic and Whig parties, but Mormonism sure could. Now, the other one, papis papism, Buchanan as a Democrat, could not uh, attack because too many Democratic votes depended on those urban machines made up of Catholics. It was up to the uh, silver-gray Whigs under Millard Fillmore to make Papists uh, the villain to distract the northern populace from the slave power. And that's how you get the uh, rise of the know-nothings. But with Buchanan in and demonizing Catholicism out of the window as an option, there was this idea to pick a fight with the Mormons. And so as soon as he comes into office, Buchanan says that they're going to replace Brigham Young as territorial governor with a non-Mormon. And this was not possible. Uh, they, the Mormons at this point uh, are feeling themselves. They had shot it out with mobs in Missouri and Illinois. They had uh, runoff Indian attacks on their way out west. They had uh, dealt with assassination attempts against their leadership and and fought off uh, bandits and rustlers on the frontier. They weren't about to give up their dream of creating their own uh, Zion in the wilderness. And so when Buchanan appoints a non-Mormon as governor of Utah and tells him to go and take office, Young refuses, and so Buchanan sends in troops uh, and, and threatens to install him into office as governor. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, the, the troops are taken over by uh, later one of the Confederacy's most able commanders, Alfred Sidney Johnston. And it is in this context, with U.S. troops making their way to Utah, that the most infamous scandal in Mormon history occurs, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And the Mountain Meadows Massacre was the systematic a uh, cold-blooded execution of at least 120 members of an emigrant wagon train going through southern southwestern Utah, the Baker Fancher wagon train. Now, at this point, the Mormons in Utah are in a paranoid frenzy and terrified about what's going to happen and that they're going to be invaded at any moment. So there are a number of uh, bloody conflicts between settlers non-Mormon settlers in Utah and non-Mormon settlers moving through Utah that lead to deaths uh, and, and violence and escalates the sense of anxiety. And it's in here, in this context, when this wagon train uh, is decided by some local Mormons to be a spy uh, for the federal government. And, and so uh, a bunch of Mormons come together under the uh, leadership of a guy named John D. Lee, uh, and some of them dressed like uh, Indians, interdict this wagon train, and after besieging it for five days, making a false offer of truce to the uh, pioneers, and then systematically massacring them. Uh, the only people who were spared were children under the age of seven who, who it was thought wouldn't be able to tell anybody. Uh, and at the time, there were there was no one even uh, arrested. Later in the 1870s, Lee would be uh, 
arrested, convicted, and executed. According to Mormon history, official Mormon history, it was all a terrible misunderstanding. There was a breakdown of communication, and so people panicked and acted on their own volition. But John Lee and others assert that uh, high up members of the Church of Latter of the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints, up to and including Brigham Young, had awareness and possibly ordered it. Uh, it's never been established fully one way or the other, but it's certainly a black mark on the Mormon record. That's for sure. So the U.S. troops on the border just sort of sit there, and there is this prolonged standoff. Brigham Young declares martial law. Some Mormons from the Nauvoo Legion, which is a Danite militia, raid a wagon train from the U.S. Army and burn 52 wagons. But the Army does not invade. And eventually, mediation occurs, but no deal can be made. Eventually, in March 1858, Brigham Young evacuates Salt Lake City and hides uh, from the advancing U.S. troops. Buchanan proclaims Utah in rebellion. Uh, there is a military invasion of Utah, uh, and eventually Cummings is installed as governor, and a military, a permanent military fort, Fort Camp Floyd, is established in Utah, about 50 miles from Salt Lake City. And eventually, without options really, Young accedes to Cummings' installation and steps down as governor. The entire thing ends up being kind of a debacle for Buchanan, though. People start calling it Buchanan's blunder, uh, because it never turns into the uh, dramatic confrontation uh, and domination that Buchanan was probably looking for. But it did uh, get rid of Mormon uh, domination in Utah politically. That was the end of the dream of a Mormon theocracy. Between Young's replacement by an appointee of the state, and later after the Civil War, the establishment of the Transcontinental Railroad, the political and the economic sources of Mormon power would be eradicated. Uh, but thanks in part to something that Brigham Young was doing while this confrontation with the United States was happening, the religious leg of the stool, the religious solidarity would be much deeper. Because it's during the confrontation with Buchanan and, the, and what became known later as the Utah War, Brigham Young is, and his cadres are carrying out something that would later be called the Mormon Reformation, which is a program of spiritual revival uh, that goes throughout the Utah territories in which Young and the Quorum go around and in a speaking circuit, impelling their followers to renew their commitment to a spiritual life. And this leads to a huge increase in the building of meeting houses, uh, more active congregations, and it also affirms the structure of church governance that had been put in by Young and the Quorum once the Utah settlement had been established. And this is a system of what is co no what are known as stakes, which are territories that are uh, controlled by a, a bishop. Now, of course, everybody here is a lay person. There is no formal clergy. There are appointed laymen, and these appointed laymen uh, are, are organized hierarchically throughout these stakes. And during the Mormon Reformation, those stakes are strengthened. And the amount of time that people spend at their church, on church business, building church uh, solidarity, increases significantly. And that sense of being besieged by the by the Gentiles certainly intensifies it. So, well, this is the period when Mormon uh, aspirations to sovereignty are uh, eradicated. The Mormon, Mormon church is solidified so that, well, yes, the Mormons were now at the mercy of Uncle Sam and would have to become subject to the market relationships of American political economy. They would be able to do so on their own terms. They would be able to do so as self-conscious members of a church whose social structure was such that it reinforced bonds instead of tore them apart. And that those reinforced social bonds 
could assimilate the American market and assimilate American politics towards the end of the community. But there's one big thing standing in the way of the church and this end, and that was polygamy. Now, polygamy had been crucial toward to the early church in that it provided a uh, matrimonial welfare state whereby single women could be brought under an umbrella of familial obligation. Uh, this is a, a proto-welfare state we're talking about. And that was very important in keeping the Mormon church together in those early awful years of privation and persecution. And also, in the sense Mormonism now, since it could no longer take power in America realistically, would have to assert itself through the strength of its social bonds, needed to define itself against an outside force. And, er, there were, and, and the early church father's opinion was that the, fa- that the alienating effect of polygamy, the thing that made it repul- repellent to non-Mormons, was a feature and not a bug. It drew the bright line between Mormons and non-Mormons. And that had crucial usefulness. But as the U.S. state increases its authority in the post-war years, as the Yankee Leviathan that, was un- that it was awoken by the Civil War comes into its own as a regulatory force, the presence of this alien social custom in Victorian America became untenable uh, for the non-Mormons, for the Gentiles, for, for Caesar in Rome. Now, Mormons by the 1870s and 80s, uh, about 20 to 30 percent of families were practicing polygamy, which obviously that's not a majority even, but it is a significant chunk. And most importantly, as a male church member, the more likely you were to practice polygamy was the more likely you were to have a high level of a higher rank within the church hierarchy. And the higher up in the church hierarchy you were, the more wives you tended to have. And so polygamy was disproportionately gathered around power socially. So it was very deeply embedded by the moment that it really comes into confrontation with the American state. And that happens. And the real starting gun for this conflict is the Supreme Court decision of 1878, Reynolds versus U.S., that declares that there is no protection, <clears throat> that there is no First Amendment protection for bigamy. You, you cannot claim religious exemption to bigamy laws. And by 1882, Congress passed something called the Edmonds Anti-Polygamy Act, which explicitly outlawed polygamy uh, and empowered the government to root it out, which was just a bullseye put onto Utah by a bunch of Victorian blue bloods in Washington who were scandalized by the very concept. Because polygamy in the post-war era was one of those boogeymen, which had not really been slain by the Civil War. Only the slave power had. But Mormonism and, and bigamy were still there, along with the, with the papists, of course. But now joined by free blacks as another, as another nightmare other. So the Victorians were horrified by polygamy, but according to the Mormons, polygamy was vastly morally superior to the nuclear family emerging in Victorian America as the ideal, because polygamy had that social welfare feature built into it that ensured women against the horrors of uh, the market, basically. Uh, According to the the Mormons of this time, the Victorian family, which was supposed to be the uh, acme of civilization and uh, morality, was the thing that created brothels and orphanages and that polygamy prevented those social evils from accumulating by preventing women from falling through the cracks. And this is, I think, uh, a good example of that keen social uh, awareness of those early Mormons that what they were running from really was the market, that they had not, they could not, they had not accepted yet the uh, ideological blinders of American mainline Protestants who saw what happened because of people's individual failings as fate, as God's will, basically. But for the Mormons, the fact that you had women selling themselves on the street and children scrounging uh, in the gutters was proof that 
uh, a system that left people outside of it if they were not able to adhere, were not able to gain a perfect match one on one, was immoral. And this reflected this was reflected in the theology of the church, which saw heaven as a network of families. Stacks and stacks of families, all hierarchically arranged. That's one of the reasons that they love baptizing dead people, is to increase one's family network in heaven. Because the greater the network you have, the, the farther you can see, the more, the more you're able to fulfill your godly potential. Uh, you can see why in the 20th, 21st century, Mormons are going to take two MLMs so easily. And so... None of this is persuasive to the, the American government, of course, which starts sending marshals in to enforce bigamy laws in something that is known in Utah as the raid, a period of years when over a thousand Mormon men were con- tried and convicted of bigamy, uh, thousands more fled, some to Mexico, and it is a polygamist sect that fled to Mexico during the raid where George and Mitt Romney's family uh, came from. Now, and, and thousands more Mormons either renounced polygamy or publicly renounced it while privately continuing it. And this repression continued until an 1893 amnesty in which the, the Mormon church vowed to obey the Ed, Edmonds Act in exchange for an amnesty uh, of anyone who was still being sought. And it's this decision that uh, helps lead to Utah's acceptance in 1896 as a state and really allows fully for Mormons to try to uh, become Americans in their own terms. Now, the renunciation of polygamy, it should said, is not taken well by everyone. Uh, a large number of Mormons say that uh, the acceptance of Uncle Sam is not worth betraying their beliefs, even if uh, the prophet once again is able to say, hey, I had another revelation that said no more polygamy. And there were, this is when you see the creation of sects that would later become things like the fundamentalist Latter day Saints uh, and create creepy polygamist compounds. I saw, I saw, I drove through Colorado City one time. Uh, everyone looked like children of the fucking corn. It was terrifying. All the houses were just a gigantic uh, on small lots, but huge houses, all of them with plywood covered extensions that hadn't even been finished yet you could tell that those houses basically never stopped getting built uh but so these that's this is when you see fundamentalist uh mormonism emerge which is people who will not accept the rendering of caesar uh their religious right to practice polygamy but the mainstream church gives up polygamy and is uh, brought into the u.s and this coincidentally is the exact same moment that the frontier closes for American expansion. And so this is the moment where uh, America comes into its own as a fully defined being, and uh, Mormonism does too. This is the end of the frontier era of America and of the Mormon church and the beginning of the progressive era. Now, uh, early on in the Utah days, the Mormons basically focused on, obviously, the work of creating their theodemocracy. But the non-Mormon settlers had their own political agenda, and eventually they formed uh, the Liberal Party, which is an umbrella party for the non-Mormons of Utah. And the Mormons answered that by uh, founding the People's Party, uh, which dissolved in 1881. And after that, just as the statehood is uh, being promulgated, you see uh, the membership start to... Uh, settle along partisan lines according to American politics. With rank-and-file Democrats, like most small farmers and mechanics of the West, voting Democrat, and the elite of the party, uh, like the elites everywhere in America, voting Republican, largely because they uh, were being schmoozed by D.C. Republicans looking to maintain uh, influence in Utah. And so this means that Eventually, you're going to have a Mormon in Congress, and that happens in eighteen or in 1903 when Reed Smoot, that's right, Reed Smoot, is elected as a Republican to the Senate by the legis- the state legislature of Utah, and so 
Reed Smoot will be the first Mormon in the Senate. And this, because sh- so short a- so shortly after the uh, Edmonds Act and the raids, scandalizes official Washington. And many members of Congress demand that Reed not be allowed to take his seat because Mormonism was in conflict with the principles of American democracy. The fear was is that, like a Catholic from the Pope, Smoot would take orders not from his conscience, as an American should, or the will of the people, but from the demands of the president of the church. And also, there was an assumption widespread that he was a fucking polygamist. Now, Smoot never was a polygamist, but come on. That was what Mormons were known for. This led to a series of hearings about Mormonism and about Reed Smoot's relationship to Mormonism that lasted from 1904 to until, until 1907. And it was a deliberation over whether Smoot would be allowed to take his seat. And this was new progressive Mormonism's coming out party for America. Moderate Mormons like Smoot got to make a case to the American people for their normalization, that they they learned their lesson and that they were normal. They loved democracy, they loved America, uh, that they were on board. And of course, this is what you do to survive, obviously. Uh, And it worked. Uh, There was never any evidence produced that Smoot was a a polygamist. He answered questions about his uh, allegiances eloquently, and he eventually wins over the uh, the center of gravity of American public opinion and the and, and the Senate. One of his allies in the Senate who uh, endorsed his ascension to the seat, in reference to all of the obvious philanderers in the Senate, uh, said, "As for me, I would rather have seated beside me in this chamber a polygamist who doesn't polyg than a monogamist who doesn't monog." Boom, roasted. And around this exact same time, a new modernized and complete Mormon theology is being promulgated that uh, channels the progressive moment and reflects America's greater aspirations. So James Talmadge, a mining consultant, uh, it, during this period in the early aughts, is going around with a series of lectures uh, about Mormon theology and about the basis for Mormon belief and what sets it apart. Uh, and during the aughts and teens, he, along with a few other theological laymen, lay out in a number of books and pamphlets a fully synthesized, modernized Mormon theology, which is the church that exists now. This is really the the creation of modern, uh, post-polygamy, post-prophetic, post-charismatic Mormon history. And in these descriptions, Talmadge explains that, for example, with polygamy, So polygamy is based on this notion of celestial marriage, a marriage that is transcends time and space. And Talmadge argues that just means that the marriage is eternal. It doesn't mean it necessarily has to be plural. So it's it's normalizing Mormonism uh, for for a mass audience. And the theology uh, that Talmadge and others promulgate is free real estate, the religion. It is America condensed into a transcendent, theology. Uh, It truly is uh, Christian Scientology uh, at a point of human history when when faith and revealed religion still had mass persuasive power. It's a er period that's dying, and in that last gasps, modern Mormonism is forged, which is essentially uh, an ideology of relentless and monomaniacal optimism. It is the American positivity compulsion turned into a story of creation. Uh, It is a religion without original sin in which all mankind will be saved because mankind is universally good and universally capable of achieving godhood. Forget capable of salvation. Salvation is a minimum. Everyone's getting saved. That's taken for granted. But humans have the capability, all of them, uh, through the application of will to pursuing virtue and self-improvement, literally take on the character of God. This is a religion that is able to 
cross that chasm between the eternal and the individual human, not by imagining a, a bridge of salvation, but of denying that there is any distinction between the two. It is in that way fully materialized. Heaven is not a transcendent reunion with a force beyond our understanding. It is the perpetuation of our individual consciousness eternally as we apply principles and self-improvement to the process of literally building a universe. There is a term that Talmud uses that becomes one of the key phrases of Mormon theology, eternal progression. God didn't even make the universe out of nothing. He shaped it out of existent matter through his own will as will all people who pursue a eternally progressive spiritual life, as in go to church, participate in church life, reflect on that life, and in so doing, bring yourself in accordance with the God within you that is already there. Sin is not, uh, in this context, original or or an indelible stain it is essentially just the consequence of failing to live failing to live up to your godly potential and that's why god will never send anyone to hell because he's mostly just disappointed you could do so much better if you're willing to accept mere salvation okay i guess fine but there are literally universes awaiting you if you are willing to try harder and aspire to more. It is a radically individualized theology. It it is American individualism uh, sacralized, but this is the most important part. It is nestled in a framework of deep social reinforcement. If you have an entire church full of people who believe this way, then they, and they participate in a church life that is as, rigorous and as all-consuming as the structures of Mormonism. Being a member of a stake is a responsibility that inputs things upon you and that spent, that makes that leads you to spend your time with the church as opposed to making money with a little bit of time for the church like everybody else in America. And making money becomes part of your life of the church because now that you have to have capitalism, you can at the very least Use your social network to make connections, to network in such a way to use capitalism towards your own collective social ends rather than the individual ends. And so even though everybody is looking towards turning themselves into God, since they're all doing it at the same time in the same way, by participating in the same social life, they're actually able to maintain that belief as opposed to everywhere outside of the, of the church where people are radically individualized, but in a desaturated spiritual environment where they don't spend that much time in church. They don't t- spend that much time with believers. They spend time among strangers, alienating themselves from each other and therefore being tossed by the seas of the market because all they can pursue is their own self-interest alone, as opposed to those within the church who are now able to pursue their own self-interest together, because their self-interest is wedded to the church, whereas outside the church, self-interest is wedded only to the self. It's at the same period that formal church behavioral doctrines, things to set Mormons apart from everyone else in America, are re-established. Now, Polygamy's out, that's the bridge too far, but how about no hot drinks or alcohol? How about no caffeine? How about that? That's kind of weird, but it's not weird enough for the fucking marshals to show up or for somebody to get a posse and burn down your church. This is when the word of wisdom is promulgated, which goes from, which takes some of the doctrines that un- during the Smith days the Smith and Young period had been mostly suggestions of best practices and turned them into formal church commandments. No hot drinks or alcohol, which replaces polygamy as the behavioral line between you 
and everybody else. It is a refusal to participate uh, in a social ritual that allows you to maintain your solidarity. Now, of course, there's plenty of Mormons who drink and have hot drinks. They're large, they're known as Jack Mormons, and there's tons of them out West. Uh, they're Mormons who might, who have never been excommunicated from the church and, and are still part of the social life of the church, but who don't really obey any of that uh, stuff. But once again, that liminal state is implied by any harsh demarcation. That's going to happen no matter what. And that's how it manifests uh, for the Mormons. Uh, so how do you go about being a good person? Well, the good news is that the two big principles of Mormonism are that the universe is comprehensible and that people can act on their comprehension of the universe. And that is a reflection of the progressive moment that America was living through when uh, empirical observation, rational scientific management was taken to be the solution to uh, mankind's mounting crises. And faith in human progress became enshrined in America's civic religion and, of course, also becomes enshrined uh, in Mormonism, which is being reformed at this moment. That means that there is no division between science and religion, that any perceived misalignment between faith and scientific understanding of the universe is just a misunderstanding that will, within time, be unfolded. Because there is no contradiction between science and religion, because we are all tasked with pursuing our self-improvement through rational observation of the world around us. So at this, by this, at this point, Utah is politically, now that it's been welcomed into the American partisan political structure, the political system, basically flows with the wind. Uh, they vote for Roosevelt, they vote for Wilson, they vote for the Republicans in the 20s, and then when the Great Depression happens, they vote for FDR and Truman. Uh, and in Utah during the Depression, a number of Mormons resurrect some of those mutual aid concepts from the days of, uh, since the days of consecration, uh, and start doing collective enterprises again, and uh, use the church structure of stakes and bishops to distribute relief. But the Mormon leadership becomes deeply alienated from the New Deal. For unsurprising reasons, they're now at the top of a uh, thriving capitalism inside Utah being carried out by Mormons, but with this new religious understanding undergirding it that allows them to participate in the market without feeling that their soul is being pulled out of their body. Because they have this social network to conduct capitalism within, they're not doing capitalism in the sh harsh stark marketplace, they're doing it in the bosom of the church. And they're doing very well. If the leadership of the of the church itself tends to be made up of very successful businessmen. And so their hostility to the New Deal is uh, pretty easy to understand. But it isn't until uh, after World War II, and specifically once the culture wars kick in the 60s, that Utah really becomes a reliably Republican state. Because they find themselves on the other end of pretty much all of the big uh, revolutionary cultural conflicts that emerge because their uh, their identity is so tied up in a revealed Christian inspired religion, and so by and after World War II, uh, the church enters as America does its Fordist era, when uh, the church goes about a process of standardizing uh, and simplifying simplifying its administration, its doctrine its curriculum for its missionaries in a process called correlation uh, that mirrors the organization of the U.S. economy around corporations that happens at the same period. It's a rationalization of the management of the church that leads to uh, the leadership of a guy named David McKay, who's the president of the, the church of Latter-day Saints from 1951 to 1970, and is essentially the CEO of Mormonism. Uh, uh, he is the CEO of Mormonism, Inc. He increases missionary uh, outreach to Americas with a new message. The, the church is wherever you are. They've given up the dream of Zion and an independent uh, sovereignty in Utah, and since now we're in a global capitalist market after World War II, 
It doesn't matter where people live. They can, they can participate in the church anywhere, as long as you can set up the structures of the church for them to live within. And McKay presides over this process of the rationalization of the church, which means extinguishing the, the, the last embers of the, uh, the charismatic prophetic tradition within Mormonism, which today largely resides uh, in the splinters. The, the, the movements that have fallen off of mainstream Mormonism, uh, and which is accelerated as economic conditions have declined, of course. So McKay takes, turns the church into a smooth functioning machine with missionaries going around the world and helping set up, uh, new stakes in new countries with, uh, thriving Mormon media, Mormon, uh, outreach programs. They create a nested series of organizations and committees and universities and nonprofit groups, all were and corporations, of course, businesses started and run by Mormons, all working together, all moving, all churning to direct tithes to a church structure that then increases the efficacy of the machine itself. So during these years, the church has turned into a finely tuned machine. Under McKay, there's a massive growth in the church. There were 400,000 Mormons around the turn of the turn of the 20th century. When McKay took power in 1951, there were 1.1 million. When he died in 1970, there were 2.8 million. In 1960, the first stake outside the United States was established in, appropriately enough, Manchester, where so many of those early British Mormon converts had been recruited. This is when McKay says Zion could be anywhere. And this is during the time, this is the time when Mormonism really gets integrated into uh, the, the fabric of America. Mormons start thriving in business and in government. Uh, George Romney, a descendant of the Mormons who fled to Mexico so they could keep being polygamous, became a chairman of GM and then governor of Michigan and a top ranked presidential candidate in 1968 before he blew his candidacy by claiming that he had been brainwashed by generals about Vietnam. Uh, But his church affiliations basically never came up in the campaign. And so, fittingly enough, a lot of the uh, energy that would have gone in a previous generation into into insisting on some sort of doctrinal orthodoxy within the church gets directed into politics. And into the vein of reactionary politics that is erupting at this same period. Because having been fully fully assimilated to capitalism and having subordinated capitalism to the project of the church, Mormons found themselves more and more amenable broadly to the politics of the Republican Party and to reactionary politics in general. Now, of course, there's plenty of Mormons who don't agree with that, but since so many Mormons are successful in business during this period, it makes sense that more of them are likely to accept the reactionary framework of the post-war crisis. And a couple of figures who help shape Mormonism's response to the social breakdown of the 60s and 70s are Ezra Taft Benson and W. Cleon Skousen, a couple of great names. Ezra Taft Benson was agriculture secretary under Dwight Eisenhower, and then he spent the 60s shaping Mormon politics around strident culture war and rabid hostility to government interference in the economy. Now, this is going to be the same combination of views that will dominate evangelical religious revival in the 70s and 80s, but Benson was a visionary of it in the 50s and 60s. It is a moralistic libertarianism that was the dominant right strain until very recently, and it has held on to the Mormons more strongly than elsewhere uh, and took on uh, and took hold earlier, basically because that combination of beliefs is at least theoretically possible under Mormonism, where church identity can plausibly withstand the alienating and the stabilizing forces of the market. So Benson becomes a uh, public and strident anti-communist, a person who uh, who sees civil rights and any kind of worker power, basically, as tantamount to communism. 
he eventually became church president in 1973. Uh, and he held off the religious shit, or he held off the political stuff once he became church president. And he focused himself more on flooding the earth with books of Mormon and making sure that the Book of Mormon was distributed as widely as possible across the world. And the other guy, uh, W. Cleon Skousen, he was a John Birch Society fellow traveler who helped articulate the specific American populist libertarian nightmare cosmology that eventually got picked up by guys like Ron Paul and uh, Glenn Beck and is now the real deep political theology of QAnon, I would argue. And it's the idea that there is an unholy alliance between uh, finance capital and communism to destroy individual human liberty. Uh, he wrote a book called The Naked Communist about the, the real goals of communism. He wrote a book called The Naked Capitalist about how the Western merchant bankers had stood up communism in order to destroy individual liberty. He saw the Constitution as divinely inspired, and therefore any attempt to uh, alter it as demonic. So this is uh, the theology of the modern right, where there is a native, God-inspired capitalism, a, a, a free market, literally, where God's will reigns. And then there is a, a cabal, a, a secret group, Jews, usually, who have used the machines of free government necessary to allow the market to reveal God's will to def deform it and, def and to twist it away from freedom, and that its tools are capitalism uh, and also the collectivizing spirit of communism, and that the long-term goal is collectivization, and that capitalism is antithetical to this process, which means that the finance capital that a Marxist might associate with capitalism is to uh, the Skousenite, and I think now uh, the right in general, that is not capitalism. That is Marxism, which is Judaism, which is the other, coming to smother uh, democracy, uh, Christ-inspired democracy. And when I say Skousen is one of the... The real progenitors of this, I'm not saying that he's the reason people believe this, just that he is articulating the only real response possible by someone who believes America is in any way godly. And that goes for Mormons and it goes for evangelicals, it goes for allegedly materialist libertarians. They all have elevated America to uh, a transcendent realm. And in so doing, they have inoculated themselves against any material critique of politics. So even though capitalism eats away at all social bonds, which is something that the early Mormons were very, very clear on and saw with their own eyes and tried to prevent, uh, by this point, Americans, even the Mormons, have largely forgotten how to see it because for them, the values of capitalism are, by, are the mechanisms by which God's will in the world is revealed. And so collectivist remedies to capitalism can only deny what God wants and impose what the devil wants, basically. It might never be thought of in these terms, but that is, that's the cosmology of American folk capitalism. And Skousen represented it. He also did help influence it because, for example, Glenn Beck's entire 912 project was inspired by Skousen's writings. And I think if you look especially at QAnon, their understanding of how capitalism works, how American politics work, who the villains and enemies are in the political economic menagerie, uh, it's all Skousen. Now, at this point, as I said, Mormonism is really being normalized into the mainstream of American culture. But, once again, as time passes, uh, new areas of contradiction emerge. And by the 70s, the new polygamy for Mormons 
was the fact that they explicitly denied membership to black uh, people, which means, among other things, that they denied mem- uh, they de facto denied the attendance of black people to their universities like BYU. And in a post-civil rights era America, where formal regimes of segregation were becoming socially unacceptable, that too had to go. And so, voila, there's another miraculous revelation that just so happens to accommodate Mormonism to the center of American politics and culture again. What a fucking coincidence. So Mormonism continues to grow. It grows internationally, and now uh, it's able to grow uh, in places like Africa, uh, and it grows in Asia. And, it's, and the growth is powered by missionaries, which is every young man uh, in the Mormon church expected to perform two years of missionary work when they graduate high school. And you might have seen them in their starched white shirts and their ties holding the Book of Mormon. You might have seen the Book of Mormon. Even if this missionary work doesn't have the impact of actually converting people, it does have the impact of confirming young members of the church in their church hierarchies. It's part of a process of rising through ranks of priesthood that was established in the Utah days and that has a very powerful influence in keeping members within the flock. And that means, and the and the fruits of that are that you know, there are fourteen mil- in two thousand ten. There are fourteen million members of the LDS Church, a little less than half of them in the United States. There are a hundred thousand Mormons in Nigeria, one hundred twenty five thousand in Japan, half a million in the Philippines. There's even a guy in England who claims that he's got a Book of Mormon that says that all of that shit happened in England, actually, which just flagrant copying from the from that blighted aisle and it's a church where membership is reinforced through behavior uh, on a typical sunday a mormon has three hours of ward meetings they have a sacramental service with uh sermons and hymns there is a lord's supper there's sunday school for the kids priesthood forums the relief society which is the woman's auxiliary meets uh, one night a week for young for teenagers, there's young men's and women's activities. The ward officials have something like 20 hours a week of duties in addition to their, their full-time other jobs because, again, there is no paid separate clergy within Mormonism. It is a fully lay, lay church. It's able to sustain its powerful level of hierarchy because of its uh, deep social grooves. And that leaves us in the church's most recent phase, which once again reflects America's phase. Like America, Mormonism is in its MLM era, multi-level marketing. The end of the yellow brick road of financialization of the economy, when pyramid schemes are the only roads of infinite growth, the thing that structured all of the dreams of free real estate and its attendant political and theological fantasies was based on. And while MLMs have sprouted up all over the country and are popular with many people, they are especially popular and especially successful in Utah. In Utah County alone, there are at least 15 major multi-level marketing companies that generate billions in revenue. It's the second biggest industry in Utah behind tourism. And as with everything else, Mormonism's ability to anticipate turns in American politics and the economy because of their self-compact social structure and ability to coordinate action through their hierarchy means that they're able to use that moment better than the rest of us. So while millions of people across the country try and fail to make money at MLMs, Plenty of Mormons succeed. Of course, not all. There's plenty of Mormons who have been absolutely screwed by MLMs, and there's plenty of poverty and downward mobility in Utah in general. But compare them to, say, America's white evangelicals, who they are largely from the same social basis of. It's not a contest. And one of the big reasons for that is that the MLM structure of marketing to social networks actually works for Mormons because they have a social network. Americans take on the the task of finding 
down lines and recruiting people into MLMs, but nobody knows anybody in this fucking country. Nobody has any friends. People don't have small families with, with relatively shallow family ties. Thanks to all of that social interaction and those big families, at this point, even without the polygamy, Mormons have a demographic engine in the form of their relentless desire to be fruitful and multiply. So you've got big families who know big families, who are all parts of stakes together, who spend hours and hours a week together, which l- creates a dynamic where, where, where a multi-level marketer can find a network of downlines to work from much more easily than non-Mormons in this country, which is just the latest iteration of Mormonism being able to adapt to capitalism on its own terms. But of course, like consecration and the United Orders, they will eventually be ground down and their social solidarity will be that further much reduced. But they will have held out as a self-conscious social entity capable of real belonging uh, much longer than the rest of us. And all because one starry-eyed water dowser in upstate New York had a vision that told him that American Christianity would drag everyone to hell. And the Mormons have been outrunning hell ever since. And we'll see, I guess, all of us, how much longer they can make it. Goodbye. Hi, folks. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of Jesus Christ's younger brother. So last time on Inebriated Pass, we wrapped up the story of the Mormons in America. This journey from a marginal cult into one of the most thriving Protestant subsects uh, in America, and how it burst out of the ferment of a uh, the early 19th century, which is really when uh, modernity really starts to emerge uh, and and in its emergence create a host of social reactions to uh, the rapid changes that capitalism was going to bring to human lives. A lot of those changes were experienced as traumatic alienation from the world as people understood it and a desire to reground themselves and regain some sense of orientation spiritually and uh, materially in a world where they could not depend on verities that had sustained their entire bloodline for generations. And this explosion creates a worldwide reckoning. You see connected and uh, integrated events a flow of events from the from the revolutions of 1848 to the colonial domination of uh, India and Africa to the American Civil War uh, to the Meiji Restoration in Japan and to in China the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom Rebellion, uh, which is the most violent of all of these conflagrations, a civil war in the late Qing dynasty that killed an estimated 20 to 30 million people, mostly through famine and disease that came with the total devastation that this war had on the regions that it touched in the central Chinese heartland. So while in the United States, we have our tidy little civil war. Yes, yes, some railroads got ripped up. 600,000 guys died, half of them from diarrhea in their uh, camp. We certainly like to think of it as the pivot point of uh, that century, but in terms of creating a, uh, a violent social release that is anywhere congruent to the size of the social uh, and civilizational dislocation that capitalism and the Industrial Revolution are bringing uh, to human civilization. This is, this is a, a, the barbaric yawp of humanity as this new thing emerges, the, 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 the birth pains of the new world, as Condoleezza Rice would have said, are felt loudest and, and most powerfully in China. And that's because while in America, the religious-infused alienation from emergent capitalism got to express itself in 
minority religious traditions that were able to thrive on the margins. And even when they were seen as threats to central power and repressed, like the Mormons, were able to flee to the free real estate to the west of the American continent. Well, in China, in the same period, uh, there is no free real estate to be had. And the social group that the heavenly father of this new cultic dynasty, who is named Huang Jiquan, are the Hakka people. And what defined the Hakka as an ethnic group in China during this period is not anything cultural or even linguistic, even though they did, by this period, have their own dialect of, of Chinese. Uh, but they were defined by their landlessness. Hakka means guest people, basically, because the Hakka descended from Han Chinese who lived in the central plain in northwestern China, the part of China that is most exposed to the depredations of the horse nomads of the Eurasian steppe, and also with the least stable environmental conditions for agriculture, leading to more susceptibility to droughts and famines. The com- this combination meant that there has been, over the course of Chinese history, since, the early, since even before the empire had been, the, the first emperor had been crowned, there is a flow of, of erstwhile peasants from northern China into central and southern China. Uh, and because those areas had land that had been spoken for, uh, by, for generations because of the persistence of the Chinese state and its ability to enshrine property rights. It meant that when the Hakka showed up and continued to show up, they were pushed to the agricultural geographical margins of the places that they settled in. They had very little access to uh, anything other than uh, laboring off the sweat of their brow. Uh, they were proto-proletarians in this sense. They're rural proletarians, which is what Mao would later later recognize them as, because they had never had any, uh, at least in their current social uh, conditions, had never had access to common husbandry or a peasant smallhold. Uh, They had always been uh, at the mercy of those who would pay them. And so that means that the most common job of the Hakka at this period are as agricultural laborers for larger landlords. But the military also saw a large amount of Hakka in it because that was another uh, option, a way to make a living uh, as an outsider, even after generations in these areas. Now, there's one main vehicle for social advancement accessible to anyone, theoretically, anybody in China down to the uh, lowliest peasant. Uh, and that is entry into the bureaucratic, the state bureaucracy, to become a Mandarin of uh, the imperial state. And this is what distinguishes, more than anything, China from Europe at this period, and I think explains why, by this period that we're talking about, the early 1800s, you have a European capitalist social structure wrapping around a technological regime and taking over the fucking planet meanwhile china which has this persistent imperial state structure stretching back 2000 years uh, and a place where every invention every technological innovation that had gone into building capitalism had also been invented often centuries before they were they emerged in europe but none of them cohered into capitalism. And that is because the system of medium-sized states in Europe led to a constant low-level confrontation and competition uh, that intensified the incentive of any given political structure within it to encourage innovation in order to win this deadly battle for control of this, the limited uh, area of this shifting, you know, continent. In China, however, because of their proximity to the steppe and the reality of nomadic invasion as the fact of life for any social order, uh, that sort of inefficiency 
that saw the landlords of Europe uh, were able to not just acquire uh, rents, but also assert military and political power. That simply could not be allowed to sustain itself. And in fact, feudalism in China is destroyed at exactly when the imper imperial rule finally emerges out of the Warring States era, because it could not be afforded. What was created instead was a meritocratic bureaucracy extending throughout every uh, its tendrils across all aspects of Chinese life, represented in every village, involved in taxation and uh, facilitating trade to the extent that it was amenable to uh, imperial stability, policing, adjudicating. Now, these jobs were very prestigious. They came with them significant salaries. It, and it was with the military and wage labor, basically, that you could uh, sustain yourself as, as a landless haka. But of these three, uh, the bureaucracy was by far the most difficult to attain because it required applicants to pass a number of increasingly difficult civil service exams meant to winnow down the pool of applicants into a small pot, acceptable group of scholars who could then be like digested into the imperial ideological womb so that they can understand the value of the system that they, represent, that they uh, support. And that value is going to come in the form of increased pay, increased lands and titles. It is a treat treadmill that can keep the people you need to be adhered to the state adhered to it. Uh, and that is through the steady arrival of an increasing paycheck and also an intellectual environment that allowed people to think that they really were embodying Confucian values and making the world the best it could be by serving this empire. They really did believe that. And that is because the actual substance of these imperial exams was the memorization and then commentary upon uh, a canon of classic Confucian texts. Uh, any young boy who was going to, and they were all, of course, boys, who was uh, going to apply uh, for the, the courses of uh, testing uh, were required as ch by the time they were children to have memorized, uh, have to memorize what is called what are called the four books and five classics, which is the Confucian canon written in, in 300 uh, BC, that, uh, and in the era before Im the uh, imperial system had emerged, in which the moral structure is based on ad achieving stability and achieving peace, and then allowing justice to flow from that, uh, which becomes a very useful ruling ideology for uh, an imperial form of government, which is why Confucianism is the dominant uh, intellectual current uh, in, Jap in Chinese society at this point, amongst its learned scholarly class. So let us turn to our little rebel, Hong Zhihuan. Now, Joseph Smith emerged in basically the same economic circumstances uh, as Zhang Zhihuan did. But his family were, of course, yeoman smallholders who had attained land as soon as they came to America and then had been working different plots of it uh, across New England and upstate New York. And it's in that context that Joseph Smith crafts his religious doctrine and creates a politics out of it. First, an attempt to actually take power in the United States through his uh, run for the presidency, which, is of which was, of course, thwarted by his assassination, at which point of repression Smith's followers, still fired with the gospel, uh, head out on their great trek to Utah, and then end up growing along with the country and eventually being assimilated into it peacefully. Uh, here we have Hong Xiquan emerging as the child of agricultural workers, but instead of people who owned their own land and, and worked it as self exploiting uh, owners. They were Hakka, and therefore landless peasants. Uh, uh, his family was, uh, by the standards of the community, uh, relatively well off. 
Uh, but it was still understood that the only way they were going to ever achieve generational s- stability would be if one of their kids made it into either the high ranks of the military or into the scholarly service. And uh, our boy Hong is a <clears throat> very bright student. It emerges very quickly that he is uh, a pot- he has potential, and so. This is where the myth of the meritocracy of the scho- of the um, of the system is exposed, because as we said, this is theoretically open to any man in the empire. But of course, since the test is memorizing and and commenting upon these Confucian texts, the more time you can spend with these texts, the better you are going to do at the test. And the young men who were able to spend the most time contemplating the text often with the aid of tutors were the children of the already wealthy of the merchant classes and landlords etc and well by haka standard huang's family has some money uh, they still have to sacrifice to get him the education and tutelage sufficient to give him a chance to pass the test so he cr- he's able to recite the four books and five classics by the time he's six, he passes. He finishes first in the local preliminary examination. Then, eventually, he has to travel to a nearby city to take the first round of imperial examinations. And, of course, you have to pay your own way to go to the test. Another winnowing factor to keep empow- the, the currently empowered classes in control of the mechanisms of the state. But here, he fails. Hong Jiquan, he cannot pass the test and he's not alone there's a very very small pass rate and the pass rate shrinks as it goes on the fourth level i believe uh, has a pass rate of less than one percent so at this point uh the family's out of money they can't keep him uh they, they can't afford to have him off studying anymore so he comes to his village which is in southern china near the vietnam vietnam border and becomes a local school teacher which is you know that that's what you do if you fail the test, basically, and and uh, and becoming a, a school teacher or a tutor. This is sort of the marginal and and low paying work that awaits you if you make for the academic track and fail it. If anything, if any of this sounds familiar to anybody, in the current situation we have in the United States. So he goes home, spends a couple of years studying and teaching. So, and it's while he's, he's waiting for his chance to take it again that he first encounters uh, some works on Christianity by Western Protestant missionaries. Protestant missionaries had been coming into China along with opium and everything else impo- imposed on it by uh, the Western states. And it was making its way, e- by this point, in, into Chinese society. There were a number of high profile converts who were writing their own uh, Christian pamphlets in Chinese and having them circulate. And according to later testimony, uh, when he sees these now, at this point, he doesn't even really pay attention to them. He's just like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But then he goes to take the test, fails it again, comes home. In, 19, in 1837, he tries a third time to pass the imperial examinations. And when he fails then, he has essentially a nervous breakdown. He becomes delirious. He is in and out of consciousness for days in a, in a delirium. His family was afraid he was going to die. And afterward, he came back to consciousness, and he claimed to have had a visitation, that he had gone to heaven and he had met God. And, and God told him that he, Hung, was his son, that he had an older son, uh, that he was the younger son uh, of his firstborn, uh, and that he charged him with the task of uh, stopping the people from worshiping demons and getting them to worship the one true God, his father. And while he was in his delirium, his family heard him shouting, uh, kill the demons. He, was, he would shout it. He would shout, kill the demons. Now, after telling everyone what he had seen, he seemed to be very unburdened. Uh, later testimony says that he was, he seemed to 
uh, have shed a lot of the uh, anxiety and misery he'd been feeling about his inability to pass these goddamn tests, but he doesn't really make anything coherent out of them. He talks about it to friends, they're certainly interested in it, but he spends his time working as a teacher, uh, he doesn't have much time to study, uh, but he still clearly has, at this point, has eyes on a one more go of it, because in 1843, he fought, tries for a fourth time, and this is it. Four strikes, you're out. Now, after this, he did not have another uh, breakdown, but he did come back home and start looking at these Christian pamphlets that were he'd had and that he'd looked at before, and he started connecting them to the vision he had had. And he put together a narrative whereby uh, the, ho- the Heavenly Father was God, as the Christians understood him, who had begat Jesus, his son, and Hong Ji Kwan was his younger brother, and that he was charged with stopping the people from worshiping demons, which was the Confucian court ideology that was placed on top of the folk paganism that the fine Chinese re- uh, religious traditions at the grassroots level. That this was a demonic ideology twisted to serve the ends of foreign rulers. And that there had been a real God, there had been a true godly worship in China before the coming of the emperor. And that that God had been uh, distorted and, and warped by the Confucian establishment. And that at this point, by the 1800s, uh, it meant that it was in the service of a domination by a foreign power. That the Han Chinese, the children of God, were being twisted into worshiping demons by, uh, for the benefit of these uh, foreign devils. And those foreign devils are the Manchu. Uh, so at this point, the Qing dynasty had ruled China since the mid-17th century. They took power from the previous Ming in the same sort of apocalyptic environmental disruption that caused the Thirty Years' War and uh, the English Civil War in, in Europe. More on that in a later podcast. And the Manchu were a, uh, like the Qing dynasty were made up of a, a elite warrior group composed of the steppe nomads, the Manchu, uh, who were part of the broader steppe nomadic cultural tradition that was most powerfully embodied by the Mongols, who had ruled China for a few centuries uh, previously before being overturned. Uh, as all dynasties eventually did in in or the emperor's empire's long history, uh, uh, there was this one state and it was eternal, but the specific dynasty that uh, dominated it would eventually, over time, uh, decay just because of you know entropy within a system more th- more than anything. Class a changing environment uh, coupled with a consistent class domination is going to eventually. Uh, create a feedback loop of uh, social hostility that's going to destroy you from within, which is, and when this happens, it is understood that the emperor has lost the mandate of heaven, which is the divine right. It's not eternally affixed to his blood the way it would be in Europe. It's affixed to his position as the one who keeps the uh, wheels of agriculture and trade and society humming. and. Eventually, you have the natural entropy that enters the system and leads to corruption and indolence at the top, coupled with cycles of natural disaster that eventually make it so that the empire can no longer effectively respond to changing conditions. That's what happened in the 17th century when the Manchu, who were essentially invited into the country to help one faction in the existing civil war that was taking place to destroy uh, the Ming, and then eventually just took over from everyone because they were the most powerful faction. They had the most internal coherence because they were emerging as a, a motivated force from uh, the step, you know, a, where <clears throat> instead of having armies made up of levied peasants and corrupt military bureaucrats, uh, 
Uh, you have a situation where the vast majority of able young men are horse riding, are well trained horse riding soldiers. And it's a long and bloody fight, but eventually the uh, Qing dynasty of Manchus takes over. Uh, and so as Hong Jiquan is building his new theological and political perspective, he identifies first the rot at the heart of the empire, which is people suffer. Those are, the people he lived around were people who lived on a knife's edge of precarity and were cruelly exploited by tax collectors and landlords. They saw no justice in the world, and it was all understood that that was the case. And this is, of course, during a cycle of eco- ecological catastrophe. You have a run of uh, droughts leading to famines all through the uh, mid mid 19th century which is going to contribute to all how all of this plays out it's going to intensify every conflict and it's going to make every conversion pitch that the uh taiping rebels have that much more persuasive when people encounter it so in a world of suffering where they're ruled over by those who claim to support all of these confucian principles but in practice only so discord and, and violence and horror uh what can be the case here he identifies the Manchu as essentially the uh, archons, the demiurgical archons tasked with keeping uh, the Han people from their knowledge of God. And the demons that he spoke of killing in 37, he now understood to be the Manchu. And he understood that there was no cohabitation between Christianity as he understood it. His need to propagated and the maintenance of uh, foreign Manchu Qi over rulership at the hand of Confucian Mandarin. He even goes to a blacksmith with his cousin and gets two giant three foot long swords with the word demon slaying sword written on them. Eventually they lose them, but uh, it really does show their commitment to the bit there. So Hong starts proselytizing. He starts talking about all these ideas he's having. And people are very much into it because he leads with the need to create social justice. He leads with we need to live as Christ wanted us to in harmony. And that means no more landlords. That means no more domination. It means living in common with common ownership. This is a utopian uh, ideology that has fired religious revo- uh, revolts against the empire going back generations. The tradition of secret societies within uh, Chinese, the greater Chinese society coming together around religious concepts, largely Taoist, that point to an apocalyptic overthrow of worldly evil and the creating of uh, a equal shared earth which is the communist dream that is has always fired uh the human heart when confronted with life at the uh end of the blade of class rule as people as these people all did so he wins over his close fa- friends and family they start talking to friends they talk to friends and soon his followers have founded something called the god worshiper society and as i said there's a lot of religious Secret societies in China, going back centuries, many of which end up becoming the uh, sort of Jacobin or Freemasonic lodges that fuel rebellions against the decrepit status quo in periods of imperial decline. And in fact, in the early 1800s, generation before this, uh, the white there's something called the White Lotus Rebellion, which is a Taoist, is a Buddhist-inspired millenniary movement seeking to bring the Buddha back to earth by overthrowing the the, uh, oppressive Qing. And oppression is understood to be economic in this understanding. So Hong keeps speaking. People keep converting. They keep coming to him. He builds a whole political and theological edifice, basically on the spot, very in a very Joseph Smith way, as just getting more supporters and then collaborating with them on what God w- wanted from them. Because just like with Joseph Smith, Hong Ji Huan 
emphasized that the prophetic tradition and said that prophecy was open to anyone. And so, of course, some of his earliest prominent supporters claimed at certain points that they were the incarnation or the embodiment of Christ or God and claimed to speak with their voice. Uh, and if he liked what he heard, uh, Hong Zhihuan would get together and declare, that's actually correct. Listen to them. They are, they are speaking with God's voice. But what's different about this is the Christian element, is the syncretic element. It is the acknowledgement of China's place in the greater world. So when the 19th, when capitalism really kicks into gear and uh, European colonialism starts mapping all of the territory where there isn't sufficient uh, advanced state authority and power to stop them, uh, so they start flowing all over the world. And eventually... They come around on the other side of the globe and find China, where instead of this uh, building a dynamic capitalist economy, they have been mired in this centuries-long decline. And as I said, it's not because of cultural reasons. It's not because of moral reasons. One's not better than others. One's not more industrious. The other one also isn't like more in tune with the harmonies of nature. It's just that in Europe, small and medium-sized states had the capacity we're able to concentrate the capital to really wring social efficiency out of technology. And we're motivated to do so because of the competition they were in with each other. So that means that innovations that could be absolutely understood to be destabilizing to a social order and to the rule of a specific class were accepted, if grudgingly, on the basis that to not do so would be to be destroyed in total. That's why everybody eventually has to, eventually in Europe, accept the British model of political economy if they want to maintain their competitive space. In China, there is no outside pressure like that. I mean, there is no internal mechanism like that because the state has monopolized that political power. And so new inventions and innovations will be accepted to the degree that they facilitate a status quo, but will be repressed if they don't. One part of this is the Chinese refusal consciously to uh, try to explore or colonize themselves, even though they were in the position to do, sh do that. In the 15th century, at the height of the Ming dynasty, uh, at, at the height of the Ming, the Ming basically pulled a James Franco and Spring Breakers and said, look at all my shit to the world with uh, something called the pleasure voyage, uh, the treasure voyages. This fleet laden with, uh, with riches was went all through the lands of uh, South Asia. But instead of setting up shop and throwing the flag out, uh, they just traded and moved on, and then eventually uh, were shut down, brought back, and trade, ship-based trade was repressed. The, the number of, uh, there was a limit on the number of masts that a ship could have to prevent Chinese ships from going too far from the mainland and, and establishing connections that might undermine the imperial power. But by this point, they could not ignore the outside world anymore. It was knocking on the door. Uh, the, op the first opium war, which happens just before this, in the 1830s, sees England basically blow open, uh, finally, China to Western capital and Western uh, exchange at the barrel of a gun. N not the old Silk Road, mutually beneficial, but now an imperial relationship. Because they could not resist it. They were incapable militarily of resisting the British army, which fought for the right to rebalance their trade with China by flooding it with opium grown elsewhere in the British Empire. One of the most astoundingly uh, cynical wars ever fought, and only the British in the fucking 19th century could have got it in their head that they were serving God by fucking forcing uh, opium at gunpoint into Chinese uh, cities. I mean, it's, it's beyond everything at time. At this point, the Anglos had been driven barking mad by, uh, by the beast that they'd created. So now, instead of invoking other traditions, Buddhist or Taoist or, or local... Uh, ancestor worship or, or Confucianism itself that might have uh, motivated other past religious movements, 
the Taiping are able to incorporate this new European uh, doctrine that uh, signaled to them their place in a larger world and therefore uh, allowed them to think politically with horizons far beyond what previous rebellions rebels were probably capable of imagining. And so fired with this new, this new understanding of themselves within a global struggle, uh, Hong's recruitment only intensifies. And villages, entire villages start to fill up uh, with, with Taiping converts. Uh, it wasn't something, it was not retail politicking. These were not people who were uh, converted one by one by a pamphlet or a knock on the door. This was entire clans, entire villages sometimes, converting en masse. Because what they heard was, uh, we can end this misery. We can, make a, we can make it so that the landless have land, because it spoke of overturning the landlords, it spoke of redistributing the land, uh, living in common, living, living in justice, which to a largely landless, exploited pe- uh, rural peasantry is music to the ears. So eventually they're able to build tens of, uh, they have a, a supported tens of thousands, which means there's whole areas that are controlled basically by the Taiping. And eventually the, this gets the attention of the central government, which leads to confrontation. But the Taiping are aided by one thing. The fact that they have been able to essentially carry out executive functions at, at the village level means that they've built a lot of goodwill with a lot of the local population because they're able to do things that the state can't, like stop banditry. Because as, as if this is uh, the Qing dynasty in decline, Imperial money is being siphoned off to private actors. Nobody really operating out of any common good within the government. That means that the uh, that their military force, their police powers, become decrepit, uh, dec- become decrepit as well. The main military organ of the Chinese Empire was the Green Standard Army, and it had its basis in the Han. The Han troops who had uh, agreed to serve the Manchu when they showed up uh, and united with them to overthrow the remnants of the Ming dynasty. It was ostensibly, it was a combination of recruitment and conscription from the peasantry uh, and a standing professional army that was supposed to serve for life. But once the war has, was over and uh, the Qing were in full control, uh, there wasn't really anything for them to do because, as I said, they're not fighting, they're not fighting external wars. So the Green Standard Army settled into becoming essentially a national police force governed by local members of the imperial bureaucracy. But they were, of course, skimming off the top by this point. The, the wages paid to Green Standard troops had not uh, kept up with inflation. So were uh, no longer livable, so that led to desertions and people er, and uh, troops trying to get employment elsewhere to supplement their income. And meanwhile, commanders would not actually replace troops who deserted or left, uh, but claim them so that they could pocket their wages, that kind of thing. So you have two endemic, so two types of organized crime emerge out of that. You have In the villages and towns, you've got the gangs, triads, secret societies that do things like sell opium and control gambling. And then you have, in the the rural country, the banditry, people who just rob folks. Uh, And while there is a kind of complicated relationship between uh, urban populations and organized crime, because they are part of the economic ecosystem, in the country, there's much more hostility to the bandits who the local government can't repress. But the Taiping, because of their organization, because of their selflessness and commitment to the cause, are much more effective at protecting people from banditry. So when the government shows up with their corrupt green standard officials and their underpaid, undertrained, uh, part time troops, the local populations rally to the, po- the Taiping banner uh and the initial attempt 
when it came in 1850 for the imperial troops to finally capture Hong and end this thing, they're ambushed and defeated several times. And they're aided in this by the fact that there is another secret society called the Heaven and Earth Society that's doing a rebellion in the same place at the same time. And they're tied up dealing with that. And it's in that context that the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom is declared. He declares the, the, he declares the Heavenly Kingdom of Transcendent Peace in January of 1851. Green Standard troops try to harsh his mellow. He, he defeats them. Now there's tens of thousands of followers. And they start moving north. And wherever they go, they're able to take the local city from the understaffed, undermotivated Green Standard garrison. And then quickly gain huge conversions to the cause. Because when they came to a city, they would do a couple things. They would declare the land in common, uh, declare the overthrow, to the la- overthrow of the landlords and the, of the landlords and the communation of property, and then also uh, have a huge massacre where they killed every Manchu in the city, uh, because these were the demons. So every Manchu quarter within every city they took was uh, destroyed down to the last person. So you have this imposition of social justice, which gets people like the dispossessed Hakka to convert in droves. Uh, you've got this punishment, this sacrifice of the, of the, of the sinful uh, rulers. Another thing they did was destroy the shit out of Buddhist and Confucian temples. They went on an iconoclastic uh, spree, just like the Puritans of England. Uh, and the early Muslims. And then you have a, a doctrine of uh, religious life in there too. Uh, whereas Joseph Smith enforced polygamy, Hong Ji Khan abolishes polygamy. Uh, he also ab- uh, abolishes foot binding, which was a, a practice common in many Chinese cities, and, and recruited women into the army and made a real attempt to uh, create sort of an austere gender equality, where women would gain equal rights to men, but men and women would be strictly uh, sexually segregated. There were women in the army, but every other element of uh, Taiping society was supposed to stress separation between men and women uh, to avoid temptation. And uh, the removal of vice became a crucial, crucial element of the Taiping religious tradition and its interpretation of Christianity, mm-hmm. which was literally misinterpretations, mistranslations of the Ten Commandments. But of course, this is inevitable because a religious attempt to create heaven on earth through the lens of Christian social teaching and values is, of course, going to have to also impose a private morality in addition to the public morality of of uh, communal land ownership and uh, the abolition of class. <clears throat> if it is to be a truly transcendental religious movement, uh, it has to be totalizing because this is proto socialism and this is what proto socialism always looks like. It's why the proto socialism of European peasant rebellions invariably included massacres of nearby Jewish shtetls. So they start rolling, and they eventually have hundreds of... They're, they're rolling through the middle, uh, up through the guts of China, into the, into the, uh, the land between the rivers, the, the heartland. And the, the, uh, red, the, blue, the green standards are completely incapable of meeting them anywhere. And the motivated people within the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom uh, are able to create an efficient, motivated military uh, fueled by a conscription system that saw one in every household required to uh, provide one adult male for the army. So the army was the, the most important, the key institution. Uh, there was an attempt to do wide-ranging reforms of bureaucracy and uh, tax collection, and as I said, uh, communization of land and the creation of communal treasuries. But what that meant in practice is, is that a lot of the trade uh, that defined urban life was basically shut down uh, but of course there was uh, but of course that trade would have been drastically reduced anyway because well 
Taiping were able to roll over uh, these parts of China, uh, it came with a massive cost. It, it, this war was a total war of devastation. Uh, everywhere that it touched, the local agriculture was completely decimated, and cities were usually burned or uh, destroyed. And as I said, in, uh, entire populations within them massacred, which just just made the local economy collapse. But because of the because of the religious fervor of those participating in it, they were able to stand up an actual relatively effective state. They could go hand to hand and go toe to toe, or could go toe to toe with the declining Qing Empire, because eventually. Nanjing, the old imperial capital, in, is captured in March of 1853. The, the a massive Green Standard Army de- decimated by the king and, uh, and the city taken. And uh, its imperial palaces are entered into in triumph by Hong and his supporters and family members. He has his top guys, his, his, his ki- cabinet, basically, his... his his marshals, his version of Napoleon's marshals, are people who had come up with him over the course of those early years, had made the early successes, mostly came out of the striving Hakka classes, uh, which disproportionately came from, came from wage earners, uh, fewer merchants, very few landlords, though there were some of them, uh, especially in the early days. But it acquired a messianic, Sort of Han nationalist character too, because it could t- they could tell a story that that made the rule of the of the uh, Qing uh, metaphysically repugnant, and in and in these early days, uh, just like Napoleon's marshals or Muhammad's early followers, uh, the cream rose to the top, and they were all dubbed by Hong to be different uh, kings of the empire. One was uh, the South King, the North King, the West King the East King, and the Wind King. And they take, they take Nanking, and it's immediately invested in a siege that lasts for years. But this is the point when the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom goes from sort of a rebellious uh, front to an actual manifesting uh, state. And it, it's able to build sort of the rudiments of an internal structure with Nanking as the capital. There are attempts to uh, go north in the northern expedition to take Beijing, which fail, which is the first real uh, bump in the road in terms of advancement for the Taiping. They, they, they can't get Beijing, which of course speaks to you know, south-north divide in China and how uh, strategically important that has been historically. But the, there's an uh, expedition west that actually does gain some territory. So at this point, the western powers start finally really paying attention because uh, they, of course, have been trying to pry open China as a market for a while now, uh, and they now have a number of trade concessions on the coastal cities centered in Hong Kong and Shanghai, where... There is a business to conduct, and they want conditions to, to conduct it. And uh, many of them started asking the question of, could we have a better deal with these Taiping fellows than with the emperor, who's been resisting us this whole time? We just had to fucking blow his doors open in the Opium War. And there's going to be a second Opium War during the fucking Taiping Rebellion, where French and uh, British troops go all the way to Beijing and uh, burn down uh, the empire emperor's garden. Just, it's just an end zone dance. It's just, it was basically a putative expedition, a rap on the nose. And there are some Westerners who really do dig the Taiping and they love that they're Christian and they love the idea of converting China to Christianity. But over time details come out and a lot of the European Christians can't really reconcile what uh, the heavenly kingdom is doing with their understanding of Christianity. And of course, class rule is absolutely part of that. One thing that definitely doesn't help the attempt of the Taiping to establish legitimacy for their Western would-be allies 
is that after the failure of the Northern Expedition, there is uh, a inevitable, I guess, turn uh, of the upper uh, the upper levels of the movement against one another because this is a prophetic tradition. Uh, that means you got anybody at any time can claim that God is speaking through them, uh, and because and Hong sort of retreats from power as his movement gains success. Uh, he is unable to assert an independent will on this thing that's moved well beyond his understanding, I think, of what he ever, of what he ever imagined would happen. Uh, he was going to bring about the end, and he probably, if you know, at the, he probably thought for most of it early on that that meant he was going to be executed by the state, but do so in a way that would allow him to meet God afterwards and be re-embraced as his son. But now he's actually an emperor in his own right, control of a vast area of territory. His closest followers start competing with one another for influence over him and start uh, distrusting one another. And there is a uh, essentially a self-purge of the top leadership where some of these uh, kings, uh, these directional kings, uh, start getting the axe. Uh, they kill each other. They are killed in turn by Hong, who is able to assert his control, but at the expense of uh, decimating his most effective commanders. So in 1856, there is uh, a civil war, basically, within the upper ranks of uh, the movement, which severely undermines Taiping and gives the empire, which is absolutely reeling at this point, a chance to catch its breath and reorganize. So the Green Standard Army has been totally washed at this point and lost any conf- the, the The emperor has lost all confidence in uh, it. So they commission a civil servant, a Han civil servant named Zhang Guofan, to essentially build a new army from scratch that will have any chance of facing uh, the Taiping in battle. And so, instead of the decrepit structures of uh, the Green Standard Army, he goes to the existing networks of local militia kept by local leaders in the province of Hunan and gets them to contribute tax uh, money and personal wealth to the building of an army and, and importantly, the paying of, of an army, the creation of a professional command uh, by guys who uh, are getting paid way more than the Green Standard chumps were uh, and would be more effectively trained and utilized. So in 1860, the Taiping were able to put together one their last big, bold, stunning victory when they, out, when they were able to break the siege of the army around Nanking, totally put the besiegers to flight, and then plunge into eastern ch- central China towards Shanghai. And it's when the Taiping get near Shanghai that the Western governments get off of the get off the bench. Basically, they've been watching both sides. They've been mulling who will be better for business, but they have. One situation which allows for business to be conducted under the Qing. And here come the Taiping to the gates of Shanghai. And who knows what they will do. The stories that had circulated about what happened to towns that had been taken by the Taiping, which a lot of them were sensationalized propaganda, were taken at face value. It was the danger of the Taiping destroying the status quo was far greater in the minds of the Western diplomats and governments uh, than the potential benefit they might bring by getting the the Europeans better deals uh, on trade if they took power. Christianity, Smishtianity at the end of the day, about that bag. So the Taiping high watermark comes at the gates of Shanghai, where they are repulsed in part by a small mercenary army made up of European and American soldiers, sailors, and roustabouts who were just knocking around Shanghai. They were originally commanded by an American mercenary 
named Frederick Townsend Ward, who is a real fucking piece of work. He had been one of William Walker's filibusters uh, in the effort to try to take over Nicaragua for Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he'd been a Texas Ranger. He was the first ballot Hall of Fame American Imperial Spear Carrier. And he took the money of uh, the Qing government to put together a effective force of about 5,000 men who were instrumental in driving back the Taiping from the gates of uh, the city. And at that point, uh, the tide begins to roll back. The ever-victorious army pushes, uh, consistently pushes back the Taiping forces who had come towards Shanghai. Meanwhile, uh, the Zhang army created by by Zhen Guofan is up and running, uh, motivated, effective. The poor guy was uh, Zhang Guofan was not a general. He was a paper, paper pusher. He was a guy who had done great on all those fucking tests that Hong couldn't pass. He w- he's gallant to Hong Jihuan's goofus. Uh, and he is tasked with the Manchu government of fulfilling his Confucian duty, which he believed in, by reimposing order. And they had a point, because this war was p- killing millions of people. Everywhere it touched, the lands died, the crops died, the people therefore died. Uh, and there's a huge internal migration of people away from the territories that were touched by the war. It would be the highest virtue to stop this. That is what he told himself, even though he was a, ha- a Han in the service of the mansion. He had a deeper Confucian duty, which is exactly the thing that Hong Shifuan fought was the demonic, false religion imposed by the Manchus. He was being manipulated by Archons, basically. But he was, if he was, it worked well because the Zhang army is able to uh, start rolling back these gains and recapturing uh, these cities and getting huge numbers of, at this point, poorly paid, poorly uh, provisioned troops to desert. And in every city that was taken, there was another massacre to match the earlier massacre of the Manchus. So when the Manchus had taken power, they had required every adult male to shave the front of their heads and put the ha- their hair into a double-plated ponytail down their back called a queue. And there had been huge resistance to that in the 17th century. There had been wars. It, uh, it took much. It took the 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 Qing probably ten years longer than it needed to to t- conquer China, because they insisted on making the Han do this. And so one of the first things that the Taiping did, of course, was say, "Fuck that shit, grow your hair out." So they were known as long hairs by the by the uh, loyal Chinese. So anybody who was encountered who had long hair just could get their head cut off. They would just do it in an assembly line fashion. Meanwhile, in Nanking, uh, the Heavenly Father is starting to lose it. He starts doubting everybody, especially after the Civil War and his top leadership. He's kind of growing isolated and decadent. Uh, Meanwhile, out in the field, many of his commanders are starting to defect. And so by 1864, once again, Nanking has been surrounded by the enemy. This time, not the Green Standard Army, but the, the Hunan Jiang Army of Zhang Guofan, which has proven itself in battle at this point. Supplies, food are running very, very scarce inside the city. And Hong orders his subjects to uh, eat manna, which is a biblical term that he encounters in his studies of the Bible and interprets to be uh, local medicinal herbs, which leads him to start eating weeds that he finds on the palace. Uh, That makes him sick. Uh, He dies on June 1st, 1864. Uh, He might also have been poisoned. Uh, But at that very moment, basically, uh, sappers of the Qing dynasty are digging trenches under the main walls of Nanking, and uh, three days after Hong's death, uh, the detonation brings down the walls. The city is taken by the Qing. There is, of course, a huge massacre of Taiping rebels. 
Hong's body is disinterned, beheaded, burned. Eventually, his ashes were shot out of a cannon to prevent anybody from uh, turning his grave into an altar. Now, it's crucial. It's important to say that this isn't just the, the uh, result of the Qing getting better and the Taiping getting worse over time at dealing with the situation. <clears throat> there is the hand of the Western governments because one of the reasons that Shanghai fell is the refusal of the British Navy, which was there, to, to allow the uh, Taiping to take it. And they provided naval logistical support to the ever-victorious army, which after the death of Townsend in 1863 is commanded by uh, General Charles Gordon, who would eventually die a martyr to the empire in Khartoum, Sudan, uh, and who would, after his time in China, forever be known as Chinese Gordon. And he's a weird uh, Volsell freak, one of the real mutants of the British Imperial Project. Uh, and he takes over the ever-victorious army and helps put paid to the Taiping rebels. It takes another decade to roll them up everywhere, and groups of them spill out to, or to become bandits and fight wars in Laos and Vietnam. But 64 is sort of the death of, it, of the Taiping as a state. And given that the cycles of Chinese history and the, 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 man, the, the way the mandate of heaven had historically worked, uh, there was no denying that the uh, Zhang Fen Emperor of the Qing had lost the mandate of heaven. Not only was a huge swath of his country in the hands of the Taiping, but there was a massive uh, uprising in the northwest uh, among Chinese Muslims. And there was endemic piracy on its rivers. There, was, there were, in 1860, there were fucking British troops stomping their muddy feet in the Forbidden City. No one in Chinese history had lost the mandate more than the Zhanfen Emperor, and the sort of tidal logic of Chinese history was that he should have been overthrown. But, because history moves in one direction, and China is only part of a world system, by 1860, there was this Western power, this coalition of otherwise competitive European imperial states that had a shared interest in seeing the king reimpose stability into the Chinese market. And they are able to tip the Coke machine back from falling over. But of course, it's not for long. The decentralization of military power that comes from the creation of the Zhang Hunan army becomes a permanent feature of Chinese politics after this and contributes to, uh, and it contributes to the dissolution of the, of the dynasty in the next decades. Because this was a sick, sick man propped back on the throne. This is a terminal patient propped back on the throne by the Western powers, and it was not long for the world no matter what they did. So in 1905, there is a nationalist revolution led by Sun Yat-sen, who grew up in the same province as Hong, grew up hearing tales of the Taiping rebels from people he lived amongst, and, and lionized Hong as a visionary someone who saw the opportunity to turn China into uh, a real nation. And then after the nationalist government collapses into warring factions and the Communist Party is driven out of the cities, figures like Mao recognize in the figure of these Hakka dispossessed peasantry, the ones who formed the, the majority of, that formed the majority of the Taiping army, uh, he saw the the material for a rural proletarian military force. And so by the time of the Long March, when 80,000 Red Army troops and family members and camp followers began their long march away from encirclement from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, that army is 70% Hakka. It's the exact same social base that fueled the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. And Mao... Mao sought to commemorate the Taiping as a proto-socialist proto movement, and they certainly are, but in the 1860s, that social formation lacked the structure imposed by the 
existence of an industrial working class within it, which had not yet cohered uh, by this point in these parts of China. And the Chinese communists are able to succeed by harnessing traditional forms of pre-capitalist exploitation with the industrialized working class that has emerged in the cities since then. I want to come back at the end here to the comparison of Joseph Smith and Hong Jifang. Both of them ended up failing in their goal to bring heaven to earth. Both of them had within their lives the knowledge that they had been defeated by the earthly forces of evil that they were in contention with. But Mormonism was able to survive in the main by an internal migration to expand, to live as they wanted to, to create a social equilibrium with market capitalism on their own terms, not through violence against the state directed upward, but by adhering themselves to the greater imperial the greater imperial violence of dispossessing natives from North America. And so Mormonism got to be a vastly influential and powerful segment of the American people. But the heavenly kingdom could only come into fatal conflict with the state because that option did not exist. You know, all that land was spoken for. Uh, plenty of Hakka uh, did respond to worsening conditions of the 19th century by emigration, but they emigrated to other countries where they were a hyper-exploited, pe- uh, hyper-exploited proletarian, uh, like in the United States. Uh, some of them became merchants, uh, but they were all as minorities within a greater uh, foreign polity that tolerated them lightly, if at all. So nothing is able to cohere there. It must wait another historical cycle until it is embodied by another fusion of peasant resentment at dispossession with a utopian, apocalyptic, European intellectual concept developed by people who had progressed farther in the process of capitalist state and cultural formation. And now with, these, with new conditions, with intensified technology and intensified urbanization, that ideology, that utopian horizon can be effectively harnessed to not just challenge for power and hold power regionally, which the Chinese communists did for many years uh, while they were in contest with the nationalists and eventually the the Japanese for control of the country. And that's one of the things that makes the Chinese Communist Party now so interesting is that their conception of uh, communism is nationalist, yes, as it is going to be in any uh, state that experienced colonization uh, from outside rather than in. The nationalism of uh, the Chinese Communist Party is deeply enmeshed in a, the traumatic memory, the traumatic cultural memory of this period, uh, the Opium Wars, the intervention against the Taiping, uh, then, uh, then the Boxer incursion, and then the horror show, the millions killed by Japanese imperialism during World War II. And it'll be interesting to see how that colors the Chinese response to the unfolding crisis of the 21st century that we're currently dealing with. I guess we'll find out one way or the other. Until then, good night.